Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But this time it's the Balkans, the border town of Ketnik, where two of the countries are meeting to settle a few assorted disputes. General Traska, delegate from one of the countries, has sent word to the commissioner that he wants to talk to one of our agents secretly. I'm the boy. I'm to pose as a correspondent and slip the general a password about pipe tobacco. I don't get the reason for the hocus pocus, but the general says we'll regret it if we don't play ball. He's a tough cookie and the commissioner wants to know what's on his mind. It's Thursday when I arrive at Ketnik and I learn that General Traska has just arrived from across the border and is holding a press conference. I head for his hotel suite. Isn't this General Traska's room? Yes, he's inside. Why do you wish to see General Traska? What's it to you? I assure you it is a great deal to me. Will you please answer my question? Before I answer, I'd like to know who is asking the question. I am Captain Ricky of the military. I see. The military usually wear uniforms. On certain occasions, it is better not to. Now, will you please tell me why you wish to see General Traska? Well, he's supposed to be holding a press conference. Oh. You are a newspaper correspondent? Steve Mitchell, Transocean News Service. Huh? Well? You appear to be genuine. Appear to be? You're a real cautious guy, aren't you? In the present situation, Mr. Mitchell, I assure you, caution is essential. Oh, what is the present situation? One of extreme tension between my country and the country represented by General Traska. If any harm comes to him during his visit, you know it will happen. Yeah. I have been selected as the General's bodyguard while he is our guest. Well, if you'll quit bodyguarding that door for a minute, I'd like to get in on the conference. Ah, of course. But I doubt you'll get an interview. The press conference is almost over. My mistake, it is over. Is something wrong, Captain Ricky? Mr. Steve Mitchell of Transocean News Service is late, General. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mitchell. My interview is over. I'm sorry, too, General. My plane was late. Have you lost something? <laughs> Guess I forgot my tobacco pouch. That that you're smoking smells pretty good. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. It's my own private mixture. Yeah, it is not as lit as I had believed. Yeah, step in, Mr. Mitchell. I think we'll have time for both the pipe full and the interview. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Ricky, for your watchfulness. I will remain outside until you have finished the interview. That will not be necessary, Captain Ricky. General, I have been officially detailed to guard your person. Have you been detailed to intrude upon my privacy? Your credentials. I uh, suppose you mean... Any others that are not forged, which no doubt state that you are a reporter. Mm -hmm. You and your country are businessmen, Mr. Mitchell. I'm certain your government will approve of my little plan. Well, it depends on what your little plan is. Your country is not in sympathy with the exact form of government which now exists in my country across the border. So? So? Perhaps we can... Change the form of government in my country. Who's going to change it? I am. My plans have been ready for several weeks. I have key men in certain positions, and I'm sure of the army behind me. You mean to seize control of your country? With the support of your government. Well, a thing like that could get pretty bloody. The end justifies the means. What we need is a leader with an iron hand. I am that leader. Boy, how many times before I've heard that tune? I am not through. I suggest you take out your notebook and pencil and pretend to be interviewing me. If you do not, you will have cause to regret it. Sit down, Mr. Mitchell. Yes? I hope the general will forgive my intrusion on his privacy, but I wish to remind him that he is scheduled to make a speech in the village square before long. Your thoughtfulness does you credit, Captain Ricky. I will let you know when I am ready. You think that your brand of government would give your citizens more freedom than they have now? I am not here to discuss philosophies of government. I'm here to make you a business proposition. 
You ought to know my government better than that. They don't support dictators. <laughs> Mitchell, I am not a fool. You have something I want, and I have something to trade. For instance? For instance, your secret file, 72. Oh, yes. The file that disappeared from your country two weeks ago. How it came to be in my possession need not concern you at the moment. The fact remains, I have it. And the seals are unbroken so far. Let's see it. No. <laughs> it is in a safe place. And I think you know I'm not merely bluffing. Look, if you think you can use that to hook us, you're mistaken. May I remind you that this is a business transaction? There's little room in this world for ethics. One must be practical. Rest assured, whether you get your file 72 or not depends on your answer to my proposition. Well, General, you see, I haven't got the authority to give you an answer on a proposition like that. I'll have to check with my boss, the Commissioner. I suggest you get in touch with them immediately. I cannot give you much time. Well, I'll see what I can do. I happen to know how important File 72 is to your government. It would be a pity to break open the seal. That's why I'm counting heavily on a favorable answer. Well, where do I get in touch with you when I'm ready to give you an answer? Yes, that's right. It would not do for us to be seen together again. Wait, I have it. I soon have to make a speech. Here. Here's the key to this room. Captain Ricky will be with me. You can come in after we are gone and wait here for me. Okay. I can't get a circuit to the States and my information won't wait. I put my message in code, but the commissioner doesn't bother. You don't need code to say no. Traska is dead. His neck is broken, and I don't have to be a genius to know it was no accident. Here's my chance to find file 72. I check a couple of drawers, and then I realize he'd never keep it in his room. My best bet is to get in touch with Captain Riki, identify myself, and ask his help. Matter of fact, you. Why? Oh, no reason in particular. I just thought you might be interested in the little matter of the murder of General Traska. What? Yes, being his bodyguard. Look, Mitchell, I warn you. I have too much on my mind to have any patience with the morbid inventions of a cheap journalist. Oh, so now it's all my imagination, huh? Well, Captain Riki, if you'll walk upstairs with me, I'll show you my morbid invention sitting in a chair with a busted neck. Very well, for the moment I will indulge your imagination. Come. Now, we'll see whether I was imagining things or not. He's 
gone. But of course. What do you mean, but of course? I saw him sitting in that chair dead not five minutes ago. I think you have carried your little game far enough, Mitchell. This is no little game. I tell you... No, 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 no. I tell you. Fifteen minutes ago, General Traska left this hotel very much alive. What? I personally saw him to his car and sent two of my men with him. So obviously he could not have been murdered in this room when he is alive someplace else. But Captain Ricky, he in was... In other words, Mitchell, this entire thing is a figment of your imagination. Oh. In the future, Mr. Mitchell, I suggest you keep your imagination more under control. I assure you my patience has its limits. What's the matter? Are you afraid the body will wander back in? I am quite certain the general does not wish prowlers in his room. Right now, I've got no friends at all in this deal. Captain Ricky lied about General Traska. Why? Maybe the boys in Traska's country found out the general was trying to double-cross them and killed him. Ricky could be in league with them. He might even be the boy who knocked off Traska. At any rate, I know I can't tell Ricky who I am and why I'm here now. I've got to find file 72, which means I've got to find out what happened to General Traska's body. Hello, Mr. Mitchell. May I help you? Yes. How long have you been on duty? Since this evening at 6. Uh, during that time, have you seen General Traska? Oh, yes. About 20 minutes ago, he went through the lobby. 20 minutes ago? Well, one, two minutes on either side. The clerk is lying, and she's doing it on someone's instructions. I bet my stack it's Ricky. Uh... I'm Steve Mitchell, Transocean Service. Yes, sir? I'm trying to locate General Traska. Oh, if you hurry, you may catch him before he finishes his speech. Speech? Yes, sir. I put him in a cab about 15 minutes ago. He said he was going to make a speech down at the square. May I call you a cab, sir? Yeah. Sorry. My name is Broga. I have information for you. What kind of information? General Traska. Oh, wait a minute. If you're going to tell me that you saw Traska ten minutes ago, save it. I'm beginning to think I did imagine the whole thing. I assure you, Mr. Mitchell, it was not your imagination. No? General Traska did leave the hotel. I saw him, but he was carried out the back by the police, and he was quite dead. Why are you telling me all this? You are a reporter. Is it not your custom to pay for what you call a scoop? Hmm? The story's good enough. A man was arrested here in the hotel. If you find out why, then you will have your story. Yeah, I remember now. I saw him taking a guy out of here with adhesive tape over his mouth. Thanks, Broga. <laughs> You in charge here? Yes. Why? I understand you arrested a man at the hotel earlier this evening. I know nothing of such an arrest. Oh, now, don't give me that. As you see, there is no such entry here in the records. You know, that doesn't surprise me a bit. Mind if I have a look around back there in the cell block? No one can go in there without a pass. Who issues the passes? I do. Well, Captain Ricky. How about... How about a pass? There will be no passes. Oh, you don't believe in freedom of the press, huh? Oh, yes. When I am certain it is the press and that the freedom is not abused. I'm just after a story. You will find no story here. You know, I got a hunch there is a story. Whether I'll find it or not, that's another matter. Captain! He tried to hang himself. Take him to the hospital. Yes, sir. Who is he? Just a harmless drunk. Just a harmless drunk, huh? <laughs> Funny. 
You know, I'd almost bet that he's the guy that you arrested this afternoon right after General Droska was murdered. I mean, right after I saw a figment of my imagination sitting in a chair, dead. You say you wish a story? Uh-huh. Very well. I will give you one. I understand that General Traska has canceled the conference suddenly and decided to drive back to his own country. Oh? Which brings me to the point. What point? You. You are a reporter, and a reporter without news is of no use to anyone. I am certain there are other places where you can find much more to write about. I get the message. And if I don't leave town? It would be unfortunate if you had to write a story about um, an accident, Mitchell. My own, of course. The next train leaves in one hour. I sincerely hope that I will not find you here in Ketnik after that. Oh, Mr. Mitchell, did you find General Truska? No, I'm afraid I'll have to wait till morning. Now I'm looking for the porter. Oh, I'm sorry. Broga has gone home. Uh, could you give me his address? Yes, I know it. I have just one hour to find file 72. That means I've got to find out what they've done with General Truska's body. Broga is my only in. Here you are, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Broker? I'd like to talk to you. At this hour? Maybe this will make it not so late. You gave your story to your newspaper? Not yet. You said you saw them take Traska's body out of the hotel. Yes. You any idea where they took it? Uh, no, none at all. Broker, you must help me. But it's you're a fool. I get it. You killed Traska. Broker wants it in the newspapers. You paid me to do it. I did not pay you to get caught. No. All right, Mitchell. Drop the gun on the bed. OK, Captain. I sort of expected you around here long about now. And I'm not surprised to find you here. We suspected Tovik faked the suicide attempt so that he would be taken to the hospital where escape is easier. We allowed him to escape, and he led us to you. You hired Tovik to kill Traska. Now that he has outlived his usefulness, he too is dead. Broga killed Tovic. He was about to do the same to me, I think. It does not matter who actually pulled the trigger. You're all in this together. What? <laughs> Would you mind telling me why I do all these things that you're accusing me of? Very well. You are the employee of Traska's country. You learned he was trying to betray you. So you had them killed here in my country, which furnished the incident which would provoke the war you seek. Oh, that's why you've got Traska's body hidden. Exactly. No body, no murder, no murder, no incident. No incident, no war. We've been a little too smart for you, Mitchell. There's nothing wrong with your logic, Captain, except that you've got the wrong boy. I think it's about time we were putting some cards on the table. Here's mine. The United States? Yeah. You know, I suspected you when you lied to me about Traska's murder. I thought you were working with the killers. That's why I didn't show you those before. Well, I owe you an apology. Now, oh, forget it. Hey, uh, Junior's coming around. Well, uh, since you're not guilty, that leaves only Broga as our man. All right, take him to jail. And have them come for Tovik's body. Well, at least you've got Traska's killer. Yeah. Exactly what happened, Captain. Well, Tovik must have climbed along a narrow ledge and in through Traska's window. I heard the struggle, and I ran inside and caught Tovik. Unfortunately, Traska's neck was already broken. But my first thought was to get him out of the hotel before he could make an outcry. <laughs> I saw you bringing him through the lobby with tape on his mouth. Well, I came in time to see you leave the general's room. I followed you, and when you started to make the telephone call, I believed you were trying to get the story out. <laughs> you did a good job on briefing your citizens on covering up the killing. You know, I was beginning to think I really was crazy until I met Broga. Well, he wanted you to know that Traska really was dead, because he thought you were a reporter. 
and that you would make a headline out of it. But you know, I still don't understand your interest in this matter. Well, Traska had a document that was stolen from my country, uh, File 72. But that's no problem now. If you just take me where you have Traska hidden, I'll go through his papers and get the file. That's the end of my job. You know, earlier in the evening I told you General Traska had suddenly decided to drive back to his own country? Now, look, don't you start that again. Traska is dead. I know, I know. But we are going to try to make it look as if that murder was an accident and that it happened in Traska's own country. I don't get you. A moment ago, one of my men started for the border, driving Traska's car with the body in it. But if he drives across the border, they'll discover that Traska is dead. Ah, he will not have to drive across. Near the border is a deserted quarry. When Traska's car is rolled off the road, it will land in Traska's country and look like an accident. And file 72? Oh, it's in the car. Great. Well, I guess that car is my next stop. Mitchell, are you insane? It will mean going into their country and trying to escape detection by their patrols. I'm not going to leave file 72 in the very country we don't want to see it. Well, yes, Mitchell, but... Look, where's the wreckage of the car? Mitchell, where's the wreckage of the car? You could never find it. What? Alone. So? I think I'd better go with you. Okay. Here, is your gun. That's Brogus. Oh. After an hour of hard driving, we pull up at the abandoned quarry. Traska's car and file 72 are already resting at the bottom. That's it. See anyone around? No. How often do they patrol this area? Three times each day, but at irregular intervals. Well, now's as good a time as any. You know, if we're caught, we may never be heard of again. We've been through all that before. File 72 is in that car. All his papers are in his briefcase. Let's go. the file yet. Leave it. If we don't find a place to hide, they will have both the file and us. Come on. What is this? His neck is broke. You go make report. I keep guard. Ah! Corporal! Corporal, come back! General Trotsky is alive. We must get him to a doctor. Come on. Uh, just a moment. Huh? Why you kick me? I wanted to make you groan. Why you not groan yourself instead of kicking me? I wanted it to sound realistic. Well, I'm not convinced. Oh, you're just a skeptic. Come on. Uh, one moment. Uh, huh? No! Ah, ha, ha. Now I'm convinced. I do groan much better than you. <laughs> Come on, let's get that file.
here's my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. This time it's Singapore, where I'm to find a girl. The only thing I know about her is that she's called the Red Queen and has a line on where I can lay my hands on a million dollars worth of rubber stolen from Uncle Sam. It's a hurry-up order, so I decide to get with it right away. I'm calling the hotel to have them pick up my stuff at the airport when a welcoming committee appears from out of nowhere and slips me the keys to the city. That's what I like about traveling undercover. Nobody ever knows when you arrive, except in my case, six bullets labeled Steve. Anyhow, the heat's on, so the sooner I get where I'm going, the better. I'm to make contact with my unknown lady down in the heart of the native quarter. It's a mangy little bistro full of foul odors and weird characters and has the well-thought-out title of Mamie Wong's Place. Yeah, Mamie Wong. Stevie. Hiya, Mamie. <laughs> good to see you. It's sure good to see you again. But I knew you'd be around here before long. The minute I heard you were in town. The minute you heard? You mean you knew I was in Singapore? Oh, sure. You ought to know well enough by this time that nothing happens in this town that gets by these old ears. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you can tell me who tried to powder me with lead the minute I got off the plane. Somebody took a pot shot at you? Six of them. I know every hatchet man in town. They must have figured you were after something pretty big to pull a cutie like that, Steve. <laughs> no, just routine stuff. Certainly nothing worth six slugs. Maybe. Well, what's your business is your business. Still, I can't figure out how come they missed you. Lousy shooting. That's just it. These thugs don't shoot lousy. Not if they want to live very long. No, Steve. They missed you deliberately. You mean it was a sort of a polite invitation to scram out of town, huh? Sure. Looks like that to me. <laughs> Hi there, Mr. Visor. Good afternoon, Mamie. What'll it be? The usual? Uh, yes. Oh, Mr. Visor, shake hands with an old friend of mine just in from the States, Steve Mitchell. Mr. Visor? I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Mitchell. I hope you're enjoying your stay here, Mr. Mitchell. Singapore can be very exciting if you let it. I'm beginning to find that out. I'll uh, take that to a table if you don't mind, maybe. Oh, all right. Help yourself. I uh, hope I see you again. Uh... Mm. One of my oldest customers. He always hangs out here whenever he's in town. Big rubber exporter up Peninsula Way. That's so? Oh, excuse me, will you, Steve? Somebody wants me in the office. Hey, man. No! to Singapore comes under the heading of I don't like it. Apparently everybody in town knows I'm here except the gal I came to meet. At least nobody around seems to fill the bill, but you never know. The come on is the queen of hearts, so I do the obvious and lay out a hand to solitaire, making sure that the scarlet lady is in full view. I kibitz? <laughs> oh, go right ahead. I always did say it was more fun playing solitaire when you weren't alone. Thanks. You're an American. I could tell the minute you walked in. So am I. Oh, yeah, I thought you were. How long have you been away from the stage? I'm too long. That's why I came over. I got lonesome. Not many Americans come to this spot. Yeah, only crazy ones like me. You know, you don't look like you go with the wallpaper in this rat pit either. Where else would they hire a dancer with two left feet? <laughs> Looks like I need help, huh? What's the matter with the Red Queen? Yeah, I think 
guess it is her next move. You're Steve Mitchell. You're interested in rubber? Yeah. You know where I can get it? The hall through the portiers, the first door on the left, is my room. Got it. Meet me there tonight at 7.30. What's the matter with right now? It wouldn't look good. Besides, I won't have all the information until then. Okay. Okay, Yank. Thanks for letting me horn in on your game. All right. See you again sometime. Sure. you're a stranger in Singapore. I used to think I was. Mind if I sit down? Well, help yourself. Thanks. Well, you said help myself. You don't think much of me, do you? I don't think of you at all. Well, as a matter of fact, I am sort of a reprehensible sort of a guy, in a way. But, uh, I have my values, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, you know my name's Mitchell, too, huh? Well, it's up to me to know things. Plenty of things. For instance, uh, I uh, also know how to do card tricks. Here, I'll, uh, I'll show you one. say that card was? Five of spades. Are you sure? Because, uh, I think it was the Queen of Hearts. Well, what do you know? Interesting. Very. You know any more tricks with the Queen of Hearts? Sure. One in particular, I'm sure, would intrigue you. But, uh... Yeah, I know. What'll it cost? Well, it might be a little dangerous. Would a hundred dollars be too much? I wouldn't pay a hundred dollars to communicate with Houdini. Oh, well, all right. But cash on delivery. Well, uh, this is hardly the place to uh, do the performance. We'll have to take a little walk. Where to? Oh, it's all right, Mr. Mitchell. You can trust me. I'm always loyal to my employers. Let's go. Wonderful, isn't it, Mr. Mitchell, what you can do with a pen knife these days? Yeah, up to and including slipping it between somebody's ribs. <laughs> I'm not responsible for anybody in here. You mean this week? <laughs> Let's see. Who have we here? Never saw him before in my life. How about this one? Mm. Who's she? That, Mr. Mitchell, is the lady you came to Singapore to find. You mean she's... Exactly. The real Red Queen. Are you sure of this? Absolutely. Hey, this thing gets screwier and screwier. If that dame's the Red Queen, then who's the dame at Mamie Wong's and what's she trying to sell? On the other hand, how do I know you're on the level? How do I know that's the real Red Queen? Well, as Confucius would say... Never mind Confucius. What do you say? <laughs> well, uh, I'm afraid you'll just have to take my word for that, Mr. All Mitchell. right. What else do you know about this? Hmm. I'm afraid there's a little uh, matter of business ethics uh, before I tell you, sir. Okay. 
There you are. Go ahead. Spill. Well, the lady was very interested in stolen rubber. I know all that. What else? The lady was also very friendly with a certain Mr. Rudolf Pisa. The guy I met in the bar? Precisely. And as you know, his business is exporting rubber. Stolen rubber or otherwise? Just rubber. How's everything going? Very well, Mimi. As a matter of fact, I think everything's going to be all right. Excuse me, Mr. Barsha. Yes? Could I speak to you a minute privately? Why? Well, it may be to your advantage. It concerns a certain dead queen. Oh, what's this about a red queen? Of course, you understand. If the information is acceptable. Yes, I know there'll be a slight fee. Get on with it. Well, a short while ago, by a strange coincidence, I visited the district mall to uh, see a sick friend. So you're the Red Queen, huh? Don't call me that. It's dangerous. All right. I'll call you Red for short. How's that? I believe you're here on business. That's right. Who stole that shipment of crude rubber and where is it? Well, it's gone. What? I'm afraid you got here too late. Too late? They moved it out last night. Who's they? I don't know. One of them wouldn't be a fellow of the name of Bicer, would it? How did you know? Well, like Max, I make it my business to know a lot of things. For example, I know you're not the Red Queen. I'm gonna believe you, Max, because I can't afford not to. But if you're wrong about this... Mr. Bicer, you don't think I'd double-cross a friend, do you? Quite frankly, yes. That's all there is to it. Stranded, working in this hole, trying to save enough money to get home. You can't blame me for listening to a proposition that might help me along. So Beister offered to pay your passage home if you'd take the place of the Red Queen and, and get me off the track by giving me a lot of phony information? You, you can't blame me. And you don't know anything about this shipment of crude rubber? Only what they told me to tell you.
evening, Mr. Mitchell. You look a little haggard. Had a bad night? For your information, I had a whopping bad night. You know what that is? That's very interesting. Looks like a guru blow dart. Where'd you find it? In the back of my neck. You obviously have enemies in Singapore. I hope you know who they are. I think I do. You're a very lucky man, Mr. Mitchell. You're only stunned. That thing could have killed you. Well, good night. Good night. Good night, Mamie. Good night, Mr. Barsley. Jumping Buddha, Steve, what's happened to you? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. Tell the truth, Mamie, I almost was one. You better let me mix you something. I think you need one. <laughs> Maybe you got something there. So, you got yourself pinked by a blowgun. Ha! By rights, you ought to be dead. <laughs> yeah, I think they only put enough junk on the thing to make me take a short nap. Another reminder that I'm not welcome. Mamie. That little weasel that calls himself Max, has he been around here? Earlier tonight. Why? I want to see him. Was he talking to Beiser? Who knows? I only keep my eye on him when he gets near the cash register. Look, Steve, I don't know what you're after that they've got, but if I've ever seen a guy building his own coffin, you're it. Oh, maybe. At least they've been polite enough to give me a couple of warnings. That's just it. The next time it'll be for keeps. Oh, lay off, honey. You're too nice a guy to see splattered up against a stone wall somewhere. <laughs> right now, what I need the most is some sleep. You got a spare room, Emmy? Sure. Always got a room for you, Steve. Here. Room 201, upstairs. Thanks. Good night, Steve. Sleep tight. And don't worry. I go up to hit the sack, but I can't make it. I'm not sleepy. So far, all I've wound up with on this deal is a double cross, first by Lana and then Max. At this point, Bicer is my top boy on the suspect list, and he's got all the qualifications. He deals in rubber, he knew the Red Queen, and he seems to have a little habit of being around most of the time, which raises a little question in my mind. Is he staying close to me, or have I stumbled onto his headquarters? Maybe now's a good time to take a look around while it's nice and quiet. Yeah. I decide to do it, but I don't get very far. Who is it? Lana. What? I know it's late, but I have to talk to you. <laughs> What's the general topic of conversation? You. What about me? Steve, I want to help you. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. What do you mean? Look, first time you tried to help me, I wound up with a blowgun dart in the back of my neck, you remember? No, I'm sorry, I can't use your kind of help. Any more of that, it'd kill me. Steve, you've got to believe me. Everything I told you was the truth. I had nothing to do with the attempt on your life. Yeah. Sure looked like a setup to me. I tell you, it wasn't. Look, all I want to do is get back to the States. Is there anything the matter with that? Well, it depends on how you go about earning a ticket. Would it be worth a ticket to you to know the location of that rubber? Is this another one of your routines, Lana? Would I risk a blowgun dart over a routine? Well, I guess you got a point there. All right, let's have it. Who is it? Mamie. I'll see you later. Stevie? Bum guess, Mamie. Looks like I'm holding open house tonight. What's on your mind? You. Oh, looks like I'm busting out all over with popularity, too. <laughs> no, Stevie. You're not. That's the point. Oh? The word's gone out about you. What word? You guess. Oh, I'm due for a trip to the morgue, huh? One way. They missed you twice. This time, they won't. Where's the word come from, Mamie? 
Who knows, but it's here. Stevie, I'm trying to do you a favor. Either clear out or get some help. Think it over. Well, that's the least I can do, Mamie. Thanks for warning me. Sure. Be smart, Steve. Good night. Good night. Well, nothing like a friendly little word of cheer to top off the day. Mamie's only trying to do me a favor, but I'm in the deal too far to back out now. I wait a few minutes for Mamie to get back to her room, and then I head for Lana's to find out what she was about to tell me. Are you looking for someone, Max? Yeah, I, I was on my way up to your room. What for? Slip that knife of yours between my ribs? Oh, you know I wouldn't do a thing like that, Mr. Mitchell. Sure, I know it, but do you? What were you going to tell me? Is that a nice me? way to talk to a friend? Sure, what were you going to tell me? Well, uh, not so loud, will you? Were you going to tell me that you'd sold me out to Bicer? Shh, you'll get us both killed. What did you tell Bicer? Oh, I, I didn't tell him nothing. Look, I know you talked to Bicer. No, I didn't really. Look, well, I found one of your half-chewed toothpicks in his ashtray. Oh, all right. I told him you know about the Red Queen, but that's all. That's all? That's enough. You don't realize that. Well, I, I knew I made a mistake, so I came back to straighten it out. It was on my conscience. I ache inside when, whenever I don't tell the truth. Oh, brother. <laughs> Look, honest, I came back to warn you. They, they're planning on killing you. I think I know who they are, but I want to hear you say it. It's Bicer. Where is he? Back there. Hmm? Yeah, Bicer owns this building. The lovers back there. They're planning on taking it out tonight. Brother, I gotta get to a phone. I think I'll need help on this. No, I've waited as long as I can. I'm gonna ship it right away. But first, I'm gonna take care of Steve Mitchell. Okay, Bicer. Mitchell. Yeah. You almost got away with it, Bicer. Drop it, Stevie. Huh? I said drop it, Stevie. Mammy. Oh, no. Don't tell me that you're in back of this racket. I did everything I could to warn her to make you lay off. Yeah. I guess if I had used my head and added a few things up, I'd have figured you. But your friend Bicer here kept stealing the show. Oh, well, anyway, Mamie. I'll be getting it from a friend, not from some stranger. Or a loo. Uh-oh. So I get the needle treatment, huh? What's the matter with a gun? Too messy, maybe? Guns make noise, Stevie boy. What's the matter, Mamie? I can't do it, Stevie boy. I just can't do it. Mamie, you know what I've got to do. David, it's been a long time. Just one favor? I'll try. Give Lana a break. She had no choice but to do what she did. Give her a break. Will you, Steve? Well, when you give your testimony, you say that. I'll say it, too. I knew I could depend on you. Oh, I'm tired. I guess I'm going to have a nice, long rest. For free. <laughs>
Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. Right now, I'm just back from a tough one in the Middle East, and I'm looking forward to a couple of days of nothing but loafing. Hi, Steve. Ah, Mr. Bad News himself. Hi, Jim. Looks like you've been taking things kind of easy. Yeah, for all the two minutes. I suppose you and the commissioner are going to fix that up. Oh, no, the commissioner sent me over here to give you a hand, Steve. Oh, well, that was nice of him. A black one. A bu you mean the black hand? The mafia? You hit it, pal. You know what that outfit stands for in Italy and Sicily? Terrorism, murder, violence? Yeah, you don't mean you and the commissioner want me to tackle an outfit like that? The commissioner doesn't expect you to stamp out the whole outfit, Steve. He's only interested in stamping out their most recent activity. What's that? They hired themselves out to terrorize the Italian voters. Keep the independent vote away from the polls. Oh, I see. They're doing a pretty thorough job of it, too. Right now, it's only on a local basis. But if it keeps up, national elections can ultimately be influenced, even controlled. Yeah, sounds pretty bad, but what's that got to do with us? Simply that this little enterprise has been financed from right here in the United States. Well, yeah? Who's doing it? We don't know. But apparently Lorenzo does. Lorenzo? That's the pen name of an Italian political commentator and writer. Oh, yeah. I think I read an article about him. He's uh, here in the United States now, isn't he? The past two weeks, on what he calls a vacation. Apparently, he remains anonymous behind the name of Lorenzo for reasons of personal safety. But we happen to know that he's working on this Black Hand affair. And he followed a lead here from Italy, trying to find the names of the men that are financing this operation. How's he doing? We think he succeeded, but he won't tell us. Why not? Remember, he's made a career out of scooping everybody. Now, he leaves for Italy this afternoon. We think that he's going to wait until he gets there and make a headline out of this information. Yeah, <laughs> looks like he's asking for trouble. He is. There have been two attempts on his life already. Now, we can't force him to reveal this information, and he's welcome to his headlines if he lives to write them. That's where you come in, Steve. Oh. Bodyguard the guy all the way to Italy, huh? Sounds like a tall order. The fact that he doesn't want a bodyguard makes it even taller. You can't let him know that you're on the job. <laughs> all right. What time does he shove off? His plane leaves at 3 o'clock this afternoon. He arrives at La Havre tomorrow morning, takes the Rome Express to Italy. That's it, Steve. He's your baby. Good luck. Thanks. And Steve. <laughs> take it easy, huh? <laughs> That afternoon at 3, I'm at the airport. Flight 26 is loading. I watch the passengers climb aboard and wonder which one of them is going to try and give me a hand on this deal. The kind of a hand I don't want, the one that's black and has mafia written on it. Signor Garmati. That's seat number six, Mr. Garmati. Yes, sir. Uh, Lorenzo. Uh, number eight. Thank you. My name is Howard Matson. My friends all call me Tex. You can call me Tex, too, honey, bug, because I'd sure like to count you as one of my friends. All right, Mr. Masson, that's seat number 20 for you. Thank you. Mitchell, Steve Mitchell. Oh, yes, Mr. Mitchell, we've been expecting you. The party you inquired about is in the seat next to you. That's seat number seven. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's a new one on me. Oh, they are Italian cigarettes. I prefer American brands, but I don't want to cultivate the habit of smoking them. They are too expensive in Rome. Oh, you're from Rome, huh? Yes. Uh, my name is Lorenzo. And you? Steve Mitchell, a New Yorker on a Roman holiday. Well, you are taking the Rome Express out of Paris? That's right. Well, we shall be traveling together then. 
I hope so. Oh, perhaps we can play a little gin rummy to pass the time. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Lorenzo, but uh, I don't know how to play gin rummy. In fact, I don't know how to play any kind of cards. You are kind, senor. Not at all. Would you mind telling me what that's going to be? A, a pair of socks. I once crippled an entire division. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Gramati is in the lounge. Would you care to sit down? Well, I'll take a rain check. Oh, senor, if you wish to exchange seats, it will be all right. Thank you, Mr. Gramati. Oh, you, you know my name. Yes, the lady mentioned it. Uh, I am honored. Uh, perhaps we can have a chat before we reach Paris, hmm? I hope so. Excuse me. Uh, your pardon. Hello, Joe. You want some... Something wrong? No, New York's trying to get through, but I can't read him. Yes, this is flight 26, but I can't read you. Over. Who? Mitchell? Mm, no. Ask him if they want Steve Mitchell. Is his name Steve? Yeah, that's the one. I'll get him for you. Hang on, New York. We'll get him for you. Mr. Mitchell, I have a radio phone call for you. Thank you. He'll be here in a minute. Mr. Mitchell? Yeah. New York wants to talk to you. I can hardly hear what they're saying, but it sounds like some guy named Jim something. Jim Fletcher? It could be. Like I say, the reception's lousy. Flight 26 calling New York. Over. Here's Mr. Mitchell. Okay, you're on. Just push to talk, release to listen, and forget the over business. Okay. Hello? Steve? Yeah, Jim. I can hardly hear you. I'll talk a little louder. We just had a flash of a new development on the case. It seems that who's ever after him is on that plane with you. Hey, I can hardly hear him. Can you do something about this thing? Oh, hang on a minute. I'll see if I can clear it. Hold on, Jim. I can hardly hear you. What you say, Steve? Yeah, that's right. Hey, Jim. Okay, can you hear me? Clear as a bell. All right, start from the beginning, will you? I said there was a new development on the case. We're certain that an attempt will be made to kill a certain party before that plane reaches Paris. Any idea who'll make it? Yes. We're almost positive. Hey, Jim. Jim. Sorry, Mr. Mitchell. Looks like I gummed up the works. Yeah, but good. How long will it take you to fix that squawk box? Now I can't fix it till we get to Paris. Oh. You know that without even looking, huh? Yeah. How long have you been operating one of these? Well, it's my first trip with this one, but I've been an RO for three years. Uh-huh. And you know enough about it to short it out any time you want to, huh? I don't get you. I'll skip it. What's your name? Joe Smith. Where are you from, Joe? Little Rock. You ever been to Italy? No, I've never been to Italy. And you can lay off the questions. Look, I tried to help you, and I flubbed it. I'm sorry. Okay, Joe, skip it. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Joe, for a boy from Little Rock, you understand Italian pretty well. So far, I've gotten a lot of breaks, all bad. I'd have given a lot to hear the next word Jim's was going to say. Now, practically everybody on the plane except Lorenzo could qualify as a suspect. could be Gramati. He's definitely Italian. Then there's his elderly neighbor, but that idea seems pretty far-fetched, which leaves Joe Smith, who understands Italian and who cut me off intentionally, or otherwise, just when Jim was giving me the name of my boy. Matson, the touring Texan, there's nothing to implicate him except his Texas accent keeps slipping. So my suspect list is wide open. 
I decide to keep my eyes the same way. I'm not worried as long as Lorenzo is beside me, but pretty soon that changes. I help you, Mr. Lorenzo. I wish to enter the radio. Certainly. You are sure this cannot be repaired in time for me to send a message? Clark, I told you a dozen times now. But how can this be? Well, if you'd have been here, you'd have seen how. The sparks flew six feet. Mr. Mitchell. Oh. Oh, he was here. Yeah. Sending a message? No, he was talking to New York. Do you by any chance remember the name of the party? Yeah, it was uh, Jim. Jim, uh... Fletcher. Anything else you'd like to know? You will pardon my rudeness. Oh, that's all right, Skip. It wasn't a secret anyway. Did you get your message through? I tried it. I was not sleepy, and since I have made the trip several times, I thought I would come in and talk to the radio operator. Oh, you've made the trip several times, huh? Ever meet Joe here before? Uh, no. He is a new one. I see. Talk and you're not sleepy. I'm not sleepy either. Come on. A splendid idea. How about this? Where we won't wake the other passengers. If, uh, if you don't mind, let us return to our own seats. Uh, it is later than I thought, and quite certainly I, I am sleepy. All right. Coffee? No, thank you. open the rest of the night, but everything seems quiet. By morning, we're over France. Good morning. Good morning, senor. Did I miss breakfast? Yes. <laughs> you were sleeping so soundly, I thought I'd not bother you. The steward has said you can ring if you want some now. Oh, a cup of coffee would be nice. We, we are almost within sight of Paris. Yeah, we should be landing pretty soon. <laughs> you weren't the only sleepyhead that missed breakfast. Oh? Who else is sleepy? Mr. Grimaldi. Grimaldi? Yeah. What's the matter? Keep everybody away from this section. Where's his seatmate? She's in the lounge. All right, find another place for her. Anybody ask you anything, he died of a heart attack. Yes. Uh, one moment, Senor Mitchell. I will take charge here. I am trained in such matters. You are not. What could a newspaper man know about criminal investigation? Perhaps this may be of interest to you. Umberto Grimaldi. Italian... Grimaldi? Si, Grimaldi. That was the real Lorenzo. Lieutenant Grimaldi and I exchanged credentials when we land. No one is allowed off the plane until the French police arrive. They take names, addresses, and statements. At their request, the lieutenant and I remain. In a few minutes, we will go to the Sûreté. By then, the autopsy report will be ready. Osters. Here's the passenger manifest you asked for. You may go, mademoiselle. Be seated, please. Now, messieurs, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Well, you saw our credentials. Oh, certainly more. But why were you both interested in the dead man? Uh, Lorenzo was a newspaper man who discovered the identities of the Americans who financed the mafia, the Black Hand, in my country. You were assigned by your government to guard it. See. Si. 
Why did you not then sit beside him? He would not permit it. At first, he would not accept any police protection. But then my government decided not to issue him a passport unless he agreed to the exchange of identities. Then why are you here, Monsieur Michel? <laughs> I wasn't informed of the switch of identities. I was guarding the wrong man. My government should have told you of the change. Our mistake cost him his life. What now, Messieurs? This man dies over the ocean. Who has jurisdiction? The French, the Italians, or the Americans? Well, Lieutenant, let's pool it and take it from there. That will not be necessary. If the French police do not apprehend the murderer, we will. Now that Lorenzo is dead, I suppose you will be taking the next plane back to the States. I suppose so. That is the smart thing for you to do. This case is no longer any concern of yours. If there are any further developments, I will take care of them myself. Well, messieurs, Lorenzo was stabbed with a sharp instrument which penetrated the heart. Death was in stand. Whoever kills the man was very clever. The court was open when he was stabbed. Then was closed to cover the tiny wound caused by the murder weapon. Now, Monsieur Le Docteur are convinced he was killed with an instrument resembling a, a, an ice pick. Thank you, Lieutenant. Senor Mitchell, I'm sorry your trip was so unsuccessful. I hope we shall meet again. Thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must report this to my government immediately. Lieutenant, do you got any doubt about that guy? Perona moi, may no, monsieur. I have no reason to doubt him. His shield carries the Italian crest. I've seen dime store badges that would fool a sheriff's office. Well, monsieur Michel, Rome is very pretty this time of year. Yeah. I've got a ticket all paid for it. I'll take care of things here. Thanks. I head for the Paris depot and board the Rome Express. It pulls out around sunset. Senor, Senor Mitchell. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, I thought you would be on your way to New York. I am, a long way. Uh, you remember our friend from Texas, Mr. Matson? Oh, indeed I do. How Very are you? nice to see you again, Mr. Mitchell. Look, you boys got something to talk about. I'll just... Uh... Not at all. Sit down. <laughs> see, I'm rather curious as to... Well, why you're going to Rome. I thought all you Texans were in the oil business. <laughs> he is in the oil business, Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, I'm probably the only Texan that don't take oil out of Texas. I bring it in. <laughs> well, at least that's a switch. You bring oil into Texas. Yeah, olive oil. You see, I'm an importer. Well, now that everything's straightened out, I'd sure like to buy you boys a drink. There's a club car right on back of this one. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Contessa, this is a pleasant surprise. Oh, how nice to see you again. I suppose you've been off on another one of your manhunts. Uh, unfortunately, yes. Uh, Countess Todesca, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Matson. Mr. Matson. Well, it's about time we made friends, Countess. Here, I got the compartment right next to yours. We're practically neighbors. <laughs> you know, all my friends call me Tex, and I'd sure like to have you call me Tex, because I'd like to count how you among you my friends. <laughs> Would you do us the honor of joining us? Well, thank you so much for your invitation. I, I'm sure I'd enjoy talking with you gentlemen, but I'm very tired. If you'll excuse me, I think I'll return to my compartment. And if you gentlemen will excuse me, I think I'll escort the Countess back to her compartment. Thank you so much for your kindness, Mr. Mitchell. And now I'll excuse you. I'm sure your friends are waiting for your return. <laughs> I'm going to let them wait. You know, it isn't every day that I get a chance to meet a real-life countess. Uh, may I sit down? Please do.
Oh, dear, what have you done? I seem to have stuck myself with something. How stupid of me to leave my knitting on the seat. Uh, sit down, Mr. Mitchell. And do not pretend innocence. I know what you are thinking. You mind if I smoke? Second thought, I don't think I want a cigarette. Please be quiet. Now, as I must think. You'll never get away with it. <laughs> this time, Mr. Mitchell, there will be nobody as evidence. Well, doggone if I haven't left my wallet in my compartment. Oh, please don't bother. I will get these. No, you don't. I'll just step back in the next car and get mine. It'll only take a minute. Things. What about the Italian policeman? I left him in a club car. Suppose he comes looking for Mr. Mitchell. We can't let him. I'll entertain him until the club car closes. Then after he retires, we'll get rid of Mitchell. Why not right now? No. He knows that Mitchell's here. Would you mind telling me how we'll pass the time in Dillon? Sure. You'll sit as quiet as a mouse. Because if you move, this kid's a regular Annie Oakley. I'd settle for gin rummy. That's it. I'll tell him you're playing gin. Thank you, sir. The club car is closing. Would you care for something else? Not for me. How about you, Lieutenant? No, no, thank you. I think I shall find Mr. Mitchell and have one last cigarette with him. I don't think it'd be appreciated, Lieutenant. I think they're enjoying each other's company. You saw them? Sure. My compartment's right next to the counters. They were playing gin rummy for half a cent a point. In that case, I think I shall retire to my compartment. I'm more tired than I realized. That's a good idea. You know, I think I'll take 40 winks myself. Swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker. Now, as soon as the steward goes by, we'll know the club car's deserted. There's a back door to the club car? Yeah, right behind the steward's pantry. All right, Mitchell. Come on. Uh, you know, if it's a drink you want, I'd... Play it smart, Mitchell. Just do as I say. and held him while she stabbed him with a knitting needle. You'll have to prove that. Your attempt on Mr. Mitchell is evidence enough. Tough luck, Tex. Now the Black Hand will have to look someplace else for money to finance their operations. And oh, thanks for delivering my message. Message? I delivered a message? Of course. How else would I have known to come back here to the club car? I happen to know Mr. Mitchell does not play cards. How then could he be playing gin rummy with the Countess? <laughs> you know, you can get into a lot of trouble gambling, Tex.
get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce, but they all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But this job sounds like a breeze. I'm flying to Macau on the China coast to spend a bunch of the taxpayers' money and hope it leads me to a counterfeiting ring out there. Yeah, it sounds like a breeze, but I've got an uneasy hunch that the breeze could turn into a cyclone with me in the middle. See anything yet? Yeah, a lot of water. <laughs> well, we ought to sight it almost any minute now. You going to be in Macau long? Well, that depends. How's that, Mitchell? Well, it depends on how they treat me. Oh, I don't think you need to worry. We like everybody in Macau, especially if they've got money. That I want to see. Well, as a matter of fact, I own a little club there, the Big Ace. Supply anything any American could ever want. If you don't see it, look me up and I'll get it for you. <laughs> well, I don't play for pleasure. Of course, if there's real dough in it, that might be different. Well, we have a little special poker game going on upstairs. High stakes. Here. The compliments of Jeff Larson. That'll get you in any time you feel lucky. <laughs> Who told you I had that kind of dough? Little bird. <laughs> We're landing in ten minutes. We're landing in ten minutes. <clears throat> I'm sorry, sir. Regulations forbid the smoking of cigars. Oh. <laughs> okay. What's this all about? You are Steve Mitchell. That's right, but you've got nothing on me. You will come with us and come quietly. Nice, friendly place, but come. Sit down. All right, you may go. Steve, good to see you <laughs> at last. Good to see you, Francesca. That was quite a reception you gave me. Well, that's the way you wanted it. How did you do with Larson? Oh, fine. We're practically buddies. He invited me to sit in on a game at the Big Ace. Gave me a ticket. Good. <laughs> what makes you think that Larson is the head of this whole counterfeiting setup? Everything points to it. Steve, I have raided the Big Ace half a dozen times, besides every other point in the area. And every sign points to Larson. But I can't pin anything on him just because some counterfeit money happened to be floating around his club. You picked up quite a lot, didn't you? Yes, a lot of money changes hand in Macau. Counterfeit bill here and there doesn't mean much. Yeah, but a quarter of a million phony Somalians dumped all over the Orient in the last six months isn't hay. This part of the world, a piece of paper with George Washington's picture on it is worth its weight in gold. People don't ask questions, they grab. Yeah, don't forget Lincoln and Andrew Jackson. They don't like the way their phony pictures have been plastered all over the Orient either. We've got to find those printing presses and Larson with them. That's the only thing that'll do the trick. Yeah. I'll put two of my men on you in case. No, no, Francesco. We've got one lead now. Let's not lose it. But these men are in my special detail. Nobody else in the department knows you are here. Okay, well, tell them to take it easy. All right, give me my blue chip and I'll be on my way. Where are you going? I'm uh, going to lose a couple of thousand dollars if I have good luck. Come <laughs> <laughs> so on. Wait a minute, you. Sorry, Buster. I don't like to be shoved. I walk slowly up to it. A nice, cozy poker game. The only thing American about it is the cards and the faces watching them flip around the table could have been from anywhere from Vladivostok to Hanoi, except Sam, the house cashier. He looks strictly out of Chicago via Las Vegas, and Maya, the house dealer. She could be out of anywhere. The kind of beauty that you sometimes find in the East, but comes from the West. She sits there dealing like a stone idol, just as hard, just as cool, and just as absolutely placid. She doesn't flicker an eyelash at me. Nobody does. As far as they're concerned, I'm just some more cigarette smoke floating around the room. I look around, not a trace of Larson. And 200 more. Ha! <laughs> 
A pair of deuces. Nice going in any league, sister. Bluffing a full house with a pair of skinny deuces. You here to watch, mister? Well, so far, nobody's asked me to do anything else. Here's a place. Nice and warm. Thanks. That's no good here. But Larson said... American game, we use American money. The cards slide out of her fingers like she's trained every one of them. Somewhere around here is something I'm looking for, but where and when will I find it? That's 200. Table is raising 200. I'll see you. Raise another 200, just to make it interesting. Cards? I'll play these. You can light a cigar with this. No good to me. That's more like real money. That does it. I have a feeling Sam doesn't like me anymore. Maya's eyes are beginning to blister the skin off my cheekbones. It's a nice, warm feeling. Well, that cleans me. That's for you, Maya. Nice dealing. Buster, no hard feelings. Look good, but all these bills have the same serial number. Better go after him, Sam. Well, it's about time for me to have a couple of visitors, I guess. And that's one part of my job I don't relish, but every once in a while I just have to take it. Add a couple of lumps to my collection on my head. Oh, oh, here we go. You don't like to be shoved. Now, Mr. Mitchell, it's you. Have a chair. Mr. Mitchell, I asked you back on account of a slight irregularity. Earlier this evening, you stopped at my little club and sat in a friendly poker game and lost $3,000. All of it counterfeit. Now, we can't operate business on a basis like that. Well, looks like you're doing all right. Yes, but we wouldn't stay in business long if all of my clients insisted upon using stuff like that. What's wrong with it? He didn't kick. Certainly better than that stage money he tried to slip me. Why, well, I know a kid in public school Brooklyn, 22, in art class, can turn out better queer than that. What about it, Sam? I don't know, boss. Somebody must have slipped me a counterfeit pen and it got mixed in. Counterfeit? Why, that stuff you tried to palm off on me was so queer that a Chinese horsefly wouldn't light on it. Here, take a look at that. That's as good as any e pluribus unum you ever held in your hand. Even the eagle doesn't know the difference. With the setup you got here, that's as good as the money in your pocket. It's still falling to me. Now, Mitchell, let's get back to our original business. You owe me 3,000 good American dollars. You mean the kind that Uncle Sam makes all by himself? I couldn't put it any better myself. Well, if you can give me a couple of days. I think we can give you a couple of days. Thanks. And Mr. Mitchell. That little brush you had with the police, what were they after? Oh, they thought I had a rabbit in my hat. And? They found I didn't have a rabbit, so they gave me back my hat. He's right. That's the best job I ever saw. Maya. 
I want to find out how much of that stuff there is around, who makes it, and where. See what you can dig up. But, Larson, this Find out if they got the plates. I can use stuff like this. I need it. I need it badly. Now, you get it. I'm sorry for what happened, Steve. Oh, skip it. You know, I was thinking about you. So soon? <laughs> you made quite an impression on me, too, last night. Oh, I'm sorry. It was business. Yeah. Oh, don't blame me too much, Steve. You don't know how hard it is for a woman to get a good job along the China coast. How hard it is to keep it. <laughs> you make the same kind of a pitch to all your ex-customers? Just to you. You know, I still like the way you deal. I'll call you on that. Why? Sometimes a woman has to play her cards on the table face up. Okay. I'll play mine the same way. What is it you like best, the color of my money or me? Both. If you'd said anything else, I'd have folded my tent and snuck away. <laughs> I'm too honest to do anything else. I'm going to take a chance on that. I've got work to do. How'd you like to tag along with me while I make 3,000 bucks? I'd love it. Here's your change as you requested. American money. Thank you. That one. Can I have that one? Sure. Don't bother to wrap it. Would you change that hundred? Shall we go, honey? Okay. I think we're being followed. Yeah, I know. It's Sam. Wait a minute. Oh, Sam. Why, if I'd have known it was you, I'd have laid out the red carpet. Maya, looks like your bookkeeper doesn't trust you. You better take him home. Larson might worry. I'm sorry, Sam. See you later. You stupid ox. Seven hundred ten, seven twenty, seven thirty. That's Steve Mitchell can sure cover ground. Well, Francesco, how'd you do? The man who followed you picked up $730 counterfeit. <laughs> right on the nose. Have any trouble? Well, Larson put a guy on my tail, see that I wouldn't leave town while I owed him 3,000 bucks. Which means? Which means I got a fish on my hook, but I don't know whether it's the big shark yet or not. And if and when will you decide? I could tell you that better if I was in Larson's office right now. What was the idea of having Sam follow me? I even check up on myself, honey. I think this Mitchell's a pretty smart operator. We wouldn't want him to think that you were being friendly to him just because I said so, would we? We were getting along fine. Ask Sam, he'll tell you. Yeah, Sam says you were getting along a little too fine. Why don't you say what you mean? Well, honey, you've always had a yen to go into business for yourself. I think it would be a great mistake. Now, let's say that this is my way of expressing to you it would be extremely unfortunate. You're worth your weight in gold to us. He's got plenty of the stuff. He kicks it around like an oil man. Nobody stops to take a second look. Has he got the plates? I don't know. He didn't give me a chance to find out. He didn't uh, drop anything offhand like? Said he was never broke. Well, he's got them. And I want him. Hello. Oh, uh, just a minute. I'll see if she's around. Hello, speaking. Oh, hello, Steve. No, no, I'm all right. No, I can talk. Uh-huh. Any way you say, what time? Okay, I'll meet you there. Bye. Larson had it figured out right, didn't he, honey? Now that you're in, Maya, you make it easy, I'll vote you in for a nice bonus. Okay, boss. And don't forget that Larson figures out the details. And don't overplay it.
Oh, Mayor, come in. You all right? I'm all right now. There you go. Oh, thank you. Come on. You know, your hunch was right. You and I'd make a great combination. I could have kicked myself for running out on you. Mm. Glad you got my phone call when you did. And if I hadn't picked it up? <laughs> if I thought he'd have laid a hand on you, I'd have busted the joint wide open. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. What did he want with you? Well, he was sore. He figured that I was after your money and he wouldn't get his 3000 He'll get it. You can tell him from me you'll get it tomorrow. I'll tell him. How'd you ever get mixed up with him? <laughs> I didn't. He got mixed up with me. I was just a hard-working girl struggling to make a dishonest buck. And? He showed me how to make two. How'd you like to make five? <laughs> Who wouldn't? String along with me? You mean all that money you've been flashing? Pardon a girl's natural curiosity, but how long can that go on? As long as I wanted to. You know, that club of Larson's is a pretty nice setup. I've got an idea that he's a competitor. You wouldn't know where he spends his extra time, would you? I'm just a hard-working girl. Or if he is a competitor. All I do is run his big game. Well, a guy in my business just has to be sure of his way around, you know. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Oh, I think I'll go change my shirt and we'll get out of here. This place is beginning to close in on me. Just straightening out the books. <laughs> a couple of old plates of a home of mine. Oh. I carry them along for luck. Let's go. Oh, May, I just remembered something. Wait for me down in the lobby, will you? I want to get some dope. Yeah. I'll be right down. Sure you'll have everything straight? Sure. All right, show him in. Oh, Mr. Mitchell, good to see you again. Larson, there you are. 3,000 hard-earned simoleons. Ah, $3,000 in three days. That's pretty good pay anywhere. It seems to be all right. That settles your account with us completely. Not quite. How about my original 3,000? Oh, yes, of course. Your deposit. Here you are. That's good stuff. That's better than good. Well, I'll be seeing you. Uh, Mitchell. I've had my eye on you for two or three days. <laughs> yeah, I know you have. You know, for a man as bright as you are, I don't think you operate very smartly. You don't? Anyone who has a goose that lays money like that can make a lot of money. Oh, I do pretty good. Like pin money. I know a man could double and triple that take. You wouldn't have to touch a single bill. If what? If you had the plates to go with the job. Well, that's very interesting. If you got the plates? Oh, could be. I'll tell you what you do, Larson. You tell this uh, somebody to get in touch with me. I always like to listen to a good story. Well, you are in touch. I know a man can spread two, three hundred thousand dollars worth of that stuff up and down this coast. Just like you spread butter on a hot day. Mm -hmm. And he cuts you in for 20%. Well, you tell the head man that I'll consider 50%. Well, he might make it 25. How oh, you be smart. You can't operate the way you're going. They'll catch up with you sooner or later. And with us, it's candy all the way. Hmm. Well, I'll think it over. I'll give you to five o'clock. Oh, wait a minute. I can't think that fast. You will, or you won't operate. Well, what if I don't want to play it your way? Then you won't operate at all. 
We can't have penny ante competition in our business. We'll put so many cops on your track that the stuff that you make won't be worth the paper it's written on. You know, back in the States, we call that squealing. It wouldn't take a man who's smart two seconds to pick up a proposition like this. Well, it's my first big deal, so I'll think about it till 5 o'clock. If anything happens to those plates, don't blame us. I won't. Nice try, Stevie. I don't think you'll need this anymore. Well, May, I thought you and I... <laughs> You're sweet, Stevie, but much too gullible. And green is a color I could never resist. Here it is, boss. What is it? Do you know what this is? Well, he told me there were plates of his old home, but we... Look at it. Five after five. I'd have made it sooner, but I was held up. Yeah? Yeah. You know, that proposition you made me, Mr. Larson, I've been thinking about it. I don't like the way you cut the deck. I'll take 50% or nothing. Well, I know a smart operator when I see one, it's a deal. The sooner we get those plates, the sooner we get action. Good. Where do I bring them? I'll wait right here for you. All right, I'll see you in half an hour. And don't try and tail me this time. Oh. I'll take these. They always bring me luck. Thanks, Francesco. Now, this may be it, so don't crowd me. Here, you might need this. You know I don't like artillery. It's too heavy. It slows me down. You better take it. One does not thrust his head into the mouth of a dragon without a fang of his own. Hey, that's pretty good, Francesco. Confucius? No. J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that looks more like it. Come on, let's go. Where? Well, we can really see what we've got. Pete, look at the place I told you about. Take a look at them. They're pretty good, huh? We'll get no kickback from that. Where'd you get them? My friend, Mr. Mitchell here. He's no friend, he's a copper. What? Are you nuts? Aren't these plates good enough for you? Mister, they're too good. All those plates there are an Eddie Green job. One of the team men nabbed him and those plates in the Bronx just two years ago. I guess that does it, Mitchell. Oh, I told you! Oh! Quite a busy man. Yeah, Francisco. Well, here it is. I guess that'll take care of your counterfeit ring. Oh? Yeah. Mm-mm. <laughs> I forgot.
べるものだけビエスカーのいいabout it, Steve. When Travis came to, the briefcase was gone. They must have cut one of the straps. I see. Excuse me. Oh, hello, Mr. Travis. Captain. And this is Steve Mitchell, agent from the States. How do you do? Travis? Steve, this is the courier who carried the briefcase. You've just arrived? Just got off my plane an hour ago. I suppose Alan's already briefed you on those confidential papers I was carrying. Yeah. Uh, according to Captain Allen, you wouldn't be able to identify any of the bunch that jumped you. No, it was dark, and as close as I could make out, they seemed to be wearing some sort of crude black hoods. Yeah. Like this. The Black Hood Gang. The which? A bunch of tough young purse snatchers. Kids in their late teens and early 20s. Left homeless by the war. Where'd you get this? Last week, a bunch of them grabbed a purse from one of our clerks in the occupation offices. She managed to pull this loose from one of them. Well, gentlemen, that leaves it in your laps. Good luck, Mitchell. Thanks, Travis. Captain? Steve, I only hope that these, these kids aren't aware of the importance of those papers. Yeah. If they realize that they're more valuable than the briefcase, there are a lot of people who pay a lot of money to get all of them. That's right. Well, I guess our first step is to make a call on Papa Schlager. Okay. Ah, Herr Captain Allen, welcome to Schlager House. Hello, Papa. This is Mr. Mitchell from the United States. How do you do, Herr Mitchell? Mr. Schlager? Oh, you must call me Papa. Everybody else does. Come in, come in. Here, please. Looks like quite a youth center you have here, Papa. Yeah, my kids, all of them. Oh, not actually, uh, but I think of them all as my kids. How long has it been now, Papa? About uh, four years, hasn't it? Mm, five, uh, yeah, five years ago. One morning I found a couple of them hiding down in my basement, sick, both of them, starving. You took them in, huh? Oh, what else could I do? The word got around, Steve. Pretty soon the kids started flocking in. <laughs> they are still coming. <laughs> Pretty nice thing you're doing here, Pop. It keeps them off the streets. Papa, about these black hoods. Uh, I do not like them to hear about such things. That is what I try to save them from. Sure. I guess the bad ones don't stay around here. Once a while, a bad apple gets in the barrel. But when I find out, out he goes. Do you know any of the members of this black hood gang? No. No, but uh, since uh, Captain Allen telephoned me, I've been making some quiet inquiries around, and I think I know the sector of Berlin where we might find some of them. Good. Uh, I might be able to take you there if you wish. It's not far. Oh, fine, thanks. <laughs> I'll get my hat. Sir. Well, it's your baby now, Steve. I've got to get back to the office. Get in touch with me there if you want me. Okay, thanks for everything, Captain. Okay. If you please. This way, please. Around the corner. 
around the corner. Walking around in the rubble looking for some of us. You know what to do. Yeah. Might as well rest a little while. We sure covered a lot of this rubble. Mm -hmm. You weren't kidding when you said this place is uninhabited. But usually it is not so completely deserted. A child or two at play. Well, let's get going. Hey, maybe this place isn't as deserted as you think. There are many stray cats in these ruins. Oh. Shoulder. I'm going after him. Did you see a guy run by here a minute ago? Yeah, I think I did. Which way did he go? Around that corner. You know him? No, I never seen him before. The muddy footprints on the sidewalk tell me the pawnbroker lied. The kid ducked into his shop. Right now, though, I'm a lot more interested in the pawnbroker than I am the kid. I stick around all night. I find a spot across the street which gives me a better view of the pawn shop. A couple of hours drag by and nothing happens. Then... Back to Schlager House. Find out what you can and then wait for me in the warehouse. I'll meet you there. All right. Are you sure he didn't get a good look at you in the rubble? I'm sure. All right. Captain Allen, Steve Mitchell. I've been worried about you, Steve. Yeah. Now, Papa Schlager called me and told me about your narrow squeak. Did you find the kid who did it? No, but I tailed him to a pawn shop and picked up a pretty good lead. But five minutes ago, it evaporated. Somebody shoved a sword through it. What's that? 
The pawnbroker. Guy by the name of Langhoff. Langhoff? Yeah. Ever hear of him? No, the name isn't familiar. Look, I'd like to go back to that pawn shop and look around, see if I can pick up another lead. Well, where are you calling from now? I'm in a phone booth across from 123 Gottenstrasse. I'll grab a Jeep and be there in three minutes. Okay. This ought to do. What now? I figure Langhoff was fenced for the Black Hood gang. Maybe some of the members don't know he's been killed. Oh, I get it. If we wait here long enough, one of them may show up with some stolen goods. Yeah. It's our one and only chance of locating the headquarters. Well, you might as well make yourself comfortable. May be here quite a while. What time is it? Twenty after twelve. <laughs> that looks like my big idea turned into a big nothing. back here. Lindorf is not there. Black Hood gang? I will tell you nothing. Oh, now, guess again, sister. You'll tell me where that briefcase is, and right now. Briefcase? That rings a bell, huh? I do not have any briefcase. <laughs> oh, don't give me that. Your gang jumped one of our agents and snatched that briefcase. Yeah, that is true. Some of the others stole it, but they did not know what it was. I only found out about it this afternoon. Then I did. I, I told him it must be returned. What? It is true. I did not want to get mixed up with the Americans. Rudy thought the briefcase might be valuable, but... Who's Rudy? My boyfriend. But I told him it must be returned. You sure? I do not have to lie to you. All right, all right, Spitfire. My name is Hertha. All right, Hertha. Where's the briefcase now? There's nothing to worry about. I told Ursula to take it back. Ursula? Who's she, another one of your gang? Yeah. Where is she supposed to take it? She was to leave it at the back door of one of your occupation offices. Which one? I do not know. Well, we'll find out. Stop it. Close, Rudy. Yeah. That member the American soldier. I saw him at Papa Schlager's and later in the rubble. He's a government agent, Ursula. He must be after the briefcase. I better take it back like Harry told me. It must be very important, this briefcase. Oh, but I've got to take it back. Who says so? Half it says so. They look official. I will bet Langhoff could sell them for us in the Eastern Sector. No. For a lot of money. No. For you and me? You and me, but I thought you and Hertha. That could be easily changed, nicht wahr? Well, well, what have we got here? One of them. Says her name is Hertha. Do you have any luck? Yeah, I grabbed the one we tailed at the warehouse. Turned him over to a policeman. 
Curtis says the briefcase was left in back of one of the occupation buildings. I thought we'd go to your office and check. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot I had the brakes tighten. Hey, this baby can really stop on a dime, can't yeah, it? Yeah, and give you eight cents change. Dime? Eight cents? Local joke. <laughs> yeah, well, what, uh, what buildings have you covered so far? Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, I got that. Okay. Oh, you, another report coming in, huh? Yeah, okay, I'll wait. Why are you looking at me? I was just wondering how you got mixed up in a deal like this. Deal? Your Black Hood deal. Is there anything wrong with wanting to eat? Well, it depends on how you get your food. And you have no family. You and your friends get it any way you can. Friends? The other ones in the gang. We all stick together. We all trust each other. I guess you haven't heard the old saying, no honor among thieves. You're going to get your briefcase back. Let me alone. You sure about that? Okay, thanks. They've checked all the entrances to the buildings of all the occupation forces. No briefcase. What? So we're going to get our briefcase back, huh? Come on, quit stalling. What did you do with it? I told her to let her take it back. I will prove it. Oh. I know where she will be hiding. I'll take you there. Okay. We'll check with you later, Captain. Okay. the briefcase. What did you do with it? I don't have it. Where is it? Let go. You tell me. I won't tell you. I said let go. You tell me or there will be more of this. Hey ladies, break this up. I will handle this. Why did you think it was Rudy when they came just now? I don't know. No. It was Rudy. He made me do it. Do what? Rudy made me give him the briefcase. Your boyfriend? Go on, you shall ask. Rudy said he was going to sell the paper to Langhorst. Then what? Then he and I were going to run away with the money. Hector. I see. Where's Rudy now? He just left. We had the briefcase hidden here. He is on his way to the pawn shop with it. These are the friends that you can trust. I thought I could count on them. Well, maybe under other circumstances you could. But the life that all of you lead, what do you expect? I chased this afternoon. Why were you trying to bean me? Langhoff ordered me to try and kill you and Papa Schlager when you were looking for a hideout. Langhoff? He's running the gang? Yeah. Then who killed him? Us? Langhoff has been murdered? That could mean that he wasn't the brains. There was someone else higher up that you didn't know about. That's right, Mitchell. Papa Schlager. Give me the briefcase. There is a surprise to you. He thought Langhoff was the more... I sent word to Langhoff to have you kill Mitchell, Rudy. But when I almost got killed myself, 
I knew Langhoff had planned to double-cross me. I only did what I was told, Papa. Of course, Rudy. I don't hold it against you. You don't think he'll let you get away with it, do you, Rudy? He'll take care of you later. He doesn't want any trouble now. Don't listen to him. You've had a pretty good deal going, Papa. You pick up homeless kids and screen them. You send the good ones to your club, and the bad ones and tough ones to Langhoff to put in the gang. Exactly. Come. My car is down the street. Are you still with me, Rudy? If you say so, Papa. And you, my dear? Lucilla told me you were going to sell the papers in the briefcase. And you and her were going to run away with the money. I only told her that she should be giving the briefcase. I knew when you found out how much money I could make in the papers, you would be glad I'd done it. And everything would be like it used to be between us. You don't believe that, do you? Why not? You see? We all stick together. Yeah. Rudy's right. I can get much money for these papers. And there will be plenty for all of us. Move. Get in. There too. There too. To the ruins of the Sturmer building. The Sturmer building? You will like it very much there, Herr Mitchell. So much that I doubt you will ever leave. It is a bombed out building with a nice deep elevator shaft. It might take months before your body was discovered. As you see, Herr Mitchell, your life is not worth eight cents. Eight cents? What is this? Just a joke, Herr Mitchell told me. But now the laugh is on him. Is it not, Herr Mitchell? Yeah, I guess so. Come, let's get started. Yeah. Thanks, Herta. At first, I didn't know what side you were on. Neither was I. I guess I did not know there was another side to be on. Yeah. Maybe I'm still not sure. Let's go over to Papa Schlager's. We'll talk about it. Papa Schlager kept a pretty accurate record of all the purse snatching. Yeah. Guess he didn't trust Langhoff. Well, with this and Papa's bank account, looks like the victims are going to do pretty well after all. What does that mean? It might mean you'll get a suspended sentence. Why are you doing this for me? Well, Herta, that's part of that other side that I was telling you about. Suspended sentence. Who knows? You seem pretty good at running a gang, Herta. Some bunch in there that could stand a good leader. Yeah, that'd really be getting on the other side, Herta. I'll think about it. Yeah, you do that.
Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. This time, it's French Morocco, Port Leote, to be exact, where the American section of the French base is being enlarged. But somewhere among the thousands of people in Port Leote, someone doesn't want the job finished. In the past month, construction has been slowed down due to a series of so-called accidents. The steps they take are rough. My job is to get over there and meet Benson, one of our agents, and between us, find out who's behind this sabotage and stop them. Hotel Agueda. Mr. Mitchell, please. Mr. Mitchell? Uh, no, sir. He has not yet arrived. When he arrives, please tell him that Mr. Benson is at 57 Rue Mezagan. 57 Rue Mezagan. All right, I'll tell him as the moment he comes. The phone number is 4623. 4623. I'll give it to him the moment he arrives. Yes, sir. May I help you? I'd like a room. Yes, of course. Uh, we have a very lovely suite on the second floor. I'll take it. Uh, has a very charming view of the city at Will night. Will you quit pressing? You've made the sale. Yes, sir. If you will sign, please. Thank you. I'm certain you will like it, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, you know my name, huh? Uh, I merely assumed... Uh, see, you are Mr. Mitchell. Your signature says so. Yeah, but you knew it before I'd finished writing it. Oh, there was a telephone call for you a short time ago. Oh, from whom? Uh, a gentleman named Mr. Benson. He uh, said you were expected and he described you. Oh? Uh, here is a number for you to call. If you like, I will get it for you. Okay. Hello, 4623, please. You are an American, sir? I am an American. I have a cousin there. Uh, he works in a sardine factory. Oh, that's nice work if you can stand it. Sir? Oh, skip it. Uh, this cousin, he writes me that uh, his job there is to see that the sardines are so placed in the can that they all face one way. <laughs> he also writes... That... Hello? 4623? Yes? Mr. Mitchell calling Mr. Benson. 21. One moment. For you, sir. Thank you. Hello? Jim? Welcome to Port Leote. Just got in, just got your message. Well, they've been so close behind me, I had to change my address. Tell you about it when you get here. Okay, how far is it? It'll take you about five minutes. All right, I'll see you then. He's coming right over. Anything new on the fire this morning? No, not a thing. Started with a small incendiary explosion. Quarter of a million dollars went up in smoke. That is the first such fire this month. Henderson, you're in charge of the supplies at the base. Did security double the guard? Huh, doubled it and tripled it. But they still get in and plant their stuff. Beats me. My police patrol outside the base 24 hours each day. They come and go like shadows. Well, I'd like to stay and meet Mitchell, but I gotta go and check on a missing truck driver of mine. Did you report his absence to my office? Well, not yet, but if I don't run him down this afternoon, I'll report him to missing persons. Look, if you get anything hot, give me a ring. Right. If he finds anything, as you say, hot, it will probably be another of your warehouses burning. The Rue Mazagan is a noisy, crooked little side street near the waterfront. It's jammed with donkey carts and a few tourists and a swarm of peddlers. As I walk along looking for number 57, one of the peddlers darts up to me, flashing a big grin. Yes, Andy. Pause and examine the treasures I have for you. Thanks, but no thanks. Here are knives fashioned by the finest craftsmen. Yeah, well, when I need one, I'll look you up. Observe. This fine throwing knife from Damascus. Its heft is perfect, its balance superb. No doubt about it. With this, an expert can split a melon at 50 paces. Well, I'm no expert, so I'll stick to a melon fork. See how its ivory handle fits the palm of the hand. <laughs> Peddler was right, Steve. This is a beautiful throwing knife. Wait. With it, an expert could split a melon at 50 paces. 
Yeah, and at close range, he could do a good job on your gizzard. Why did you not turn over this man to my police? <laughs> you think he'd have told who hired him? No, monsieur. But uh, he was probably after your money. Uh, I don't think he was after my money. Well, I'll have my men investigate, but I'm afraid it's hopeless. Probably to you, all peddlers look alike. You think it ties in with this sabotage deal, don't you, Steve? Well, if that happens to me again, Benson, the answer is definitely yes. Guess you saw the smoke rising from the fire at the airfield. Yeah, when I flew in. Henderson had to pull every available man off of construction to fight it. Lost hundreds of man hours. Who's Henderson? He's in charge of construction of the base. You know him well? Known him for years. He's as clean as a pin. He'd be here now, but he had to check up on one of his men. That fire could have been much worse, Monsieur Mitchell. Yes. If the blaze had reached those big gas tanks, it would have been goodbye base. Uh, so far, how close have you come to whoever's behind this whole deal? Mighty close. So close that uh, night before last, they tried to kill him. Hmm? I did get a, get a dunking in the harbor. In the harbor? Oh, I was nosing around the waterfront. Someone sneaked huh. up behind me and clouded me. Then they tried to finish me off with a knife. Next thing I knew, I was in the water. <laughs> One of my men heard the noise and went to investigate. The would-be killer had fled. It's a good thing he did it. There'd be no more Benson. But they're on to me now, Steve. That's why I'm on my way back to the States. From here on in, it's in your lap. Well, so far, what have you picked up on him? That's just it. I haven't got a thing. Well, then, why would they risk moving in on you? Because I either know more than I think I know, or they think I know more than I think I do. Come again? <laughs> Steve, ever hear of Vilok? Vilok? <laughs> yeah, isn't he that international Joe for hire, no job too little or too big? We have a copy of the police dossier on Aristide Vilok. Any pictures? No. We have no idea what he looks like. Chiefly because, well, no one has ever lived to describe him. <laughs> oh, fine. I've been on the trail of this boy for a long time, Steve. Wherever there's trouble, there's Vilok. Palestine, Jordan, Greece, Turkey. Wait a minute. Yeah. What are you driving at, Steve? You must have been pretty close on his trail or he wouldn't have risked an attempt on you. Could be. That means that he won't rest until he's sure you're polished off. So? So, instead of breaking our backs trying to find this gent, why not let him find you? Well, I hope that newspaper story does the trick. Oh, have no fear, Mitchell. By now, all of Port Jose knows that the body of an unidentified man was found floating in a bay. Well, then one of our visitors should be Vilok. Yes, but uh, which one? <laughs> Probably the one we least suspect. <laughs> Where is he, attendant? There he is, a little guy. Ah, uh, attendant? Uh, good day, messieurs. What can I do for you? I'm Captain Laborde. At your service, Captain. How long have you been on duty? I've just arrived, monsieur. Oh, then you do not know if there have been any persons seeking to identify the body of the man we found in the bay? No, monsieur, I do not know which body that would be. Well, you probably will when you look at your record. Ah, uh, will that be all? Uh, you may go, thank you. If you need me, I will be at the rear. Merci. All right. We may as well make ourselves comfortable, huh? Yeah, all we can do now is wait. Maybe a long one. What time is it, Mitchell? 9.30. One would think somebody would have turned up by now. Nah, maybe my little gag wasn't so hot. Hmm. 
Someone just came in the front door. I might be recognized, so I'll duck. Are you in charge here? Uh, oui, mademoiselle. What can I do for you? A man was found in the harbor. That is correct. I'm Jeanne Moliere. I'm looking for my fiancé. He disappeared three days ago. I didn't hear the word, and I thought perhaps he... His name? Shal Hammett. He's tall, broad shoulders with blonde hairs. His eyes are blue. No, the body of the man we found in the harbor does not answer that description. Are you certain? Quite. I hope this is good news for you, mademoiselle. Oh, yes. I didn't really believe that he was dead. Mm -hmm. It is, that is not like him to live without a word and I... Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. What do you think, Captain? Oh, a shattered romance, nothing more. <laughs> you sound pretty positive. Well, I've seen the girl before. Jeanne Moreau is a dancer at the uh, Café du Chien d'Or. Have you ever heard of this Charles Hammett? No. But there are many Americans in Poliote these days, especially at the base. You know, Captain, a thought just occurred to me. Suppose Vilak is a woman. It is a possibility. Gina's in a good spot to get a lot of information about the base. Yes. Good evening, gentlemen. Who are you? Emilio Ruiz of Lisbon, private investigator. My card. Didn't hear you come in. I entered as the young lady was leaving. Nor did we hear your approach. <laughs> I did not want to disturb you. Has the body been identified yet? May I ask your interest in the matter? Allow me to explain. I am employed by a certain lady in Lisbon. Her husband left her some time ago after a violent quarrel. I see. He was last seen in Tangiers a month ago in the company of a young lady. Not a word of him since. My client, of course, is very sad. She loved him deeply. And besides, when he left, he took all her jewels. You think the body could have been your client's husband? If I may review the remains. Oh, that's impossible. Oh? Yes, the body is no longer there. A relative has claimed it. I see. So it could hardly be your client's husband, could it? No, of course not. Mm. But perhaps if I could see the other remains. No, they are all known to us. They could not be the man you seek. I think I'll take a little walk. You want to come along? No, I'd better stay here. I'll call up the base and check on Charles Hammett. Yeah. Hello? Hello, uh, donnez-moi la base. I only wanted to talk with the young lady. Yeah, do you have to push her in the doorway to do that? I have nothing to say to this man. Mademoiselle, I, I only wanted to ask you about my client's husband. What's the matter, Ruiz? Didn't you believe us back there at the morgue? You said a relative had identified the body. I realized it must have been this woman who was leaving as I entered. And I, it occurred to me that it might have been my client's husband after all. So you followed her? I identified nobody at the morgue. I was looking for my boyfriend. Huh? Wait a minute. Here, here is his picture. Well, I'm very sorry, this is not the man. Just a minute, Miss Molier. Monsieur, you have been most kind, but now I'm light for my appearance. Wait a minute, I'd like to take another look at that picture of that boyfriend of yours. Why are you so interested in Charles? Oh, just curious. I used to know a fellow by that name. Not him. Mm. 
Mitchell. Laborde. I was looking for you when this... Yeah, do you always go looking for people with a gun in your hand? Oh, you do not understand. Uh, nor do I, and I don't intend to remain here to hear about. I'm um, late. Sorry, I startled you. Good night, gentlemen. Mitchell, come with me. He was preparing to split the melon at 50 paces. Well, you can call off your men, Laborde. You found your peddler. The one we attacked you this morning? Yeah. Looks like he was trying for a repeat performance. I'll send a man to pick up the body. Why were you following me? Right after you left, Henderson arrived. I wanted you to meet him. Henderson? Why was he interested in the body? Oh, he said a man uh, of his employment was missing. Hmm. Where is he now? Uh, waiting at the morgue. What was that? Oh, the bell. Another inmate has arrived. Inmate? Yes. Look, I'm looking for one of my men. Well, you've probably come to the right place, monsieur. Uh, pardon me. I do not know, monsieur. No identification on him? None. Where'd you find him? Less than a block away. Now, if you will excuse me, monsieur, I must go to the police station and make my report. Would you like to see him, monsieur? Perhaps he is the man you're looking for. Okay, we might as well. Where's the body? Over there. Well, monsieur? Yeah, that's my man. Will you be leaving? No, I'm gonna wait for Captain Laborde. You can wait for him in the office. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Henderson, this is Steve Mitchell. <laughs> Glad to know you, Henderson. Well, the same here. I understand one of your men is missing. Not anymore. Huh? You mean uh, he is here? Yeah, the ambulance driver and the attendant brought him in a few minutes after you left. Are you sure it's your man? Yeah, it's my truck driver. Where is the, this ambulance driver now? Well, he went to the police station to report the murder. I'll go and question him. Where's the attendant? He was around here just a minute ago. Anybody else here at the time? No, just the ambulance driver, the attendant, and myself. Mm -hmm. Well, somehow... Hey. Uh, yeah, it looks like blood. But they brought my uh, driver here not long ago. No, no. That's something that happened right here. drops leading that way. Yeah, right through that door. to death. Yeah. What I don't get is, why would he get killed in here? Would you know him? No. How about you? Huh. Murder in the morgue? Well, does it tie into the fact that Benson's body is supposed to be here? How did you know that, Henderson? Laborde told me. Now, wait a minute, Mitchell. 
Skip it. Yeah, let's not skip it. I was here alone, I'll admit it. But I didn't kill this man. I didn't say you did. Well, don't. I've got as much at stake in the sabotage thing as you have. If I don't come up with an answer, they'll send somebody to take my place. What's your idea, Henderson? Well, I don't know. If this man was killed here, the man that did it didn't have much time to empty his pockets. Mm -hmm. Pierre Ducas. That mean anything to you? No. Occupation. Hey, maybe we've got something. Morgue attendant. Wait a minute. This isn't the bird that Laborde and I talked with when we came in here first. Well, I don't get it. That's the real attendant. That first one was a phony. Well, then who was the phony? Who do you think? The little guy that nobody ever lived to describe. Vlock? Yeah. Oh, that doesn't make sense, Mitchell. Vlock wouldn't have stayed around here after he found out Benson wasn't really dead. Put it together this way. Vlock read that story we put in the papers. He came here to check up on it. The attendant got suspicious and started to phone the police, as he'd been told to do. And Vlock kills him? Yeah. And he hears Laborde and I coming in. Before he has a chance to make his investigation, he jumps into the attendant's uniform. Well, why didn't he make his search and leave? Because he heard Laborde and I talking. He realized we'd set a trap for him. So he stuck around to figure out just how much we did know. Henderson, what kind of identification did your driver use to get through your guards? Oh, a regular security badge. The kind with a picture on it? No, just had some numbers. But everybody at the base knew him very well. Let's take a look at it. It's gone. Yeah, Vlock's got it. He's got an open sesame to the whole base. Well, I'll get on the phone and cancel that badge. What is your hurry, gentlemen? You thought I would be at the base, and indeed I would be. Except the base will wait for me. You would not. Pretty cagey, Vlock. Exactly. You see, to complete my work, I must remain Vlock. The man no one has lived to describe. Stop where you are. I'm taking no chances with you. Twice you escaped, thanks to the stupidity of the peddler. But I assure you, I am not stupid. You're still not in the clear, Vlock. Laborde saw you, too. He'll figure out something. No, Mitchell. You are going to call him and ask him to meet you here. Sorry. No sale. Well, I don't have much time. You think I'm going to ask Laborde to walk right into a bullet? You're all wet. Very well. Mr. Henderson, you will call. Mitchell gave you my answer. I'm sorry, Henderson. You forced me to change my plans. All right, Mitchell. If you want to play hide and seek. Sure. I'm fine. Well, Henderson. Mitchell, what happened? <laughs> There's your prize package. All signed and sealed for delivery. Vlock. This is Vlock? Yeah. Vlock the saboteur. Maybe I should say the ex-saboteur. The man that nobody ever lived to describe. Somehow or other, I've got a hunch that a lot of people are going to get to know him. But like him, they'll all be wearing numbers.